talk about, again, a way, a, will there ever be real revival? This is part four in this, and I, I just want to just reiterate a few things that we've already said, and then we're going to uh, just kind of uh, go from there, launch off from there, and believe God uh, that everything that He desires to be said is going to be said, even though I've only got a few minutes, but you know, we're going to just pick it up at speed, and uh, you know, you, when you listen to it online, if you do listen online, you can just slow me down if you want to, all right? Uh, but anyway, uh, we were talking about what does revival mean? Revival means to live anew, to recover, uh, to make a lie, uh, to enliven, to refresh, to rebuild, to restore to life. And certainly, as I've already shared with you, the church of Jesus Christ needs to, uh, to come alive afresh. Uh, yes, we have the life of God on the inside of us, but there needs to be a rekindling. There needs to be a refreshing. There needs to be a restoring uh, in each and every one of our lives. I'll tell you, I remember when I was young, uh, a teenager, uh, 17 years of age, and I received the infilling of the Holy Spirit for the first time. I got saved. I accepted Jesus when I was only 12 years old. My grandfather died. My paternal grandfather passed away, whom I was very, very close to. And that was the first time in my life uh, that someone I loved passed away. Someone I uh, really knew and was close to passed away. And I think that everybody at one time or another, you experience that. You experience that first time when somebody you really loved uh, passed away. You know, prior to that as a boy, you know, I thought, well, you know, our people, we don't go. We don't, we don't die. You know, I just had this in my head. But I was 12 years old and I experienced my grandfather passing away. And I'll tell you, I was angry. I had prayed. I prayed. I asked God to help us. I, I, pray, I prayed and asked God uh, that he not die. He was only 67 years old. That seemed old when I was 17 or 12, I should say. Uh, it doesn't seem so old anymore. Uh, but anyway, he was only 67 years old and he died. He passed away the day before Thanksgiving, 1972. He passed away. And so I was angry at first, very angry. And you know, there was kind of a crossroads. How many of you know we come to certain crossroads in our lives? And that was a crossroad in my life because I could have stayed angry and mad and bitter at God or I could have decided I'm going to turn toward God and really give him my life. And thank God my dad, uh, who is the son of the grandfather who passed away, he straightened me out. And he told me I can't stay angry. He told me uh, that I needed to give it to the Lord. My dad got saved back, I think, in 1967 or so. And, and so, uh, you know what? I thank God for that, that I accepted the Lord. I came to Jesus, and the reason I knew how to do it is I just had always heard it. My grandmother, my, my paternal grandmother, always listened to Oral Roberts. I don't know why I'm going this direction. Probably because I don't have time to get into my teaching. But I'll tell you, you know what? I'll tell you, thank God for praying grandmothers. Praying grandmothers, amen? She used to watch Oral Roberts on television and make me sit there and watch it with her. And, and you know, how many of you know something good is going to happen to you? That's what he always said, isn't that right? I remember that just as a boy, just him saying those words. Something good is going to happen to you. How many of you believe that today? I believe something good is going to happen to us as we trust him and put our lives in his hands, as that song said. We can trust him because every good gift, James says in James chapter 1 and verse 17 or 19, it says every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He's a God of good good gifts. Is he not? Amen. And so he said, he said, something good is going to happen to you. And then my grandmother, you know, she used to make me watch this lady by the name of Catherine Coleman. And she was a great evangelist, healing evangelist, man. As a 12 year old and younger, I thought that woman's nuts, man. She, she just acts weird. She acts crazy. I mean, that woman's nuts, but you know what? Just sitting there uh, listening because I wanted to sit and be respectful to my grandmother. You know, back then kids were more respectful to but anyway, I want to be respectful to my grandmother. And so I'd watch Catherine Coleman with all her idiosyncrasies and everything else. How many of you know if you sit around and you receive that long enough, something gets on you? Isn't that right? Amen. Are you hear what I'm telling you? Amen. I remember watching a guy by the name of Rex Humbard. See, I'm getting you stirred up now. Some of you remember. And, and you know, but the point that I'm saying is, thank God I accepted Jesus as my Lord. And then at 17, I heard more of the gospel, that full gospel about being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking with other tongues. And I received that when I was 17 years old, and it changed everything. It changed everything, changed the direction of my life. I decided instead of being a forest ranger that I had planned on being all my uh, teenage years, now I had to serve God. I had to preach. I had to tell other people about this, this good news that's not like any other news that I had ever heard uh, before. And, and, and to fill, get them filled with the Holy Spirit and experience the fullness of God. As we sang that song, 
as we sang that song. It's not by our might, not by our power, but by His His Spirit. Amen? It's by His Spirit. And He fills us up to overflowing uh, when we trust Him to do it. And so our question is, what's revival? It's a time of refreshing. I want you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, and we'll save whatever. We'll maybe someday get to this message that I have on my PowerPoint. My father said to me, he said that you need to, you need to give your heart to the Lord. You need to, to, to let go of anger because anger was the issue there. One time he told me, because I had a bad temper anyway as a kid, but, but uh, yeah, I had a bad temper as a kid anyway, and uh, he told me one time, he said, he said, if you don't do something about that anger, someday you're going to kill somebody. I won't even tell you some of the stories of things I did when I was angry. I mean, it's just shameful. It's just shameful. Hurting people, you know. How many of you know hurting people is not a good thing? Isn't that right? It's just shameful. I don't even like talking about that stuff. Uh, But he said, if you don't get a hold of that anger, someday you're going to kill somebody. And how many of you know Jesus can take care of anger? He he can take care of uh, uh, bitterness. He can take care of all these things as we give our lives to him. He can can help us be all that he's called us to be, right? Thank God as Christians, we don't have to try to be something in our own effort. As Christians, he helps us. He changes us on the inside. Religion wants to change change the outer, isn't that right? Try to make you look good, make you look religious and pious. Uh, But Christianity changes you on the inside, makes you a new creation so that gradually you become more on the outside what you are on the inside. Amen? Amen. Now in Acts chapter 3, it says, beginning with verse 18, are you there? Say yes if you are. And and here's Peter preaching here on the day of Pentecost, or or actually it was after that, uh, but it was a result of that day of Pentecost. And it says this in verse 18, it says, but those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent. Everybody say repent. We've been talking about repentance. And so here Peter is preaching repentance uh, to his audience. Repentance means to change your mind with the result that you're going to change the direction that you're going. I've been sharing with you how that basically up till now, two things I've shared with you uh, that are needed for revival. And those two things, number one is humility. That he revives, Isaiah 57, he revives the heart of the contrite and humble ones, does he not? He revives the hearts of those who say, God, I need you. I need your help. I I need everything you've got for me because I can't do anything in my own strength or my own ability, right? And so he revives the heart of the humble. And then we talked about repentance, how that's a change of mind with the result of changing the direction that you're going in your life. And not, not not just changing direction in your own power, but turning from the power of Satan to the power of God and letting God's power now work in your life to enable you and empower you over the over sin that might try to come against you in life. Amen? So he says, repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing, everybody say, times of refreshing, may come from the presence of the Lord. Now note that now. He's saying to these people as they are inquiring as to how they might have a relationship with God through Jesus, he says, repent, be converted, and then the promise is that as one who has repented and converted to Christ, gave their life to Christ, that there is throughout our Christian life going to be times of refreshing from the presence of God. As we live for him, we should expect that there are going to be times. That word times means seasons. It has the idea of an opportune moment. How many of you know that that throughout our Christian life, there are opportune moments that God sees fit? It's time for a refreshing. It's time for a refreshing. And, And really all we need to do is repent again if we need to and receive. Isn't that right? God is a restorer and he wants to pour out his spirit afresh. He wants to bring refreshing into your life today. I know, you know, I, I, I was thinking about this as I, as I was standing here and sharing about my, a little bit of that testimony. You, you know, the thing with it is, is concerning this idea of refreshing. Some of you might remember a day when you were just on fire for God. Maybe when you first accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You were on fire for God. And not only that, but you just couldn't get enough of this book. I mean, I remember, man, when I first got saved, and especially when I got filled with the Holy Spirit when I was 17 years of age, and that was just like yesterday, I mean, 17 years of age. And so, but I remember, man, I couldn't get enough of this Bible. 
I just couldn't get enough of it. The Spirit of God was doing a work in my life, and I just couldn't get enough of it. Back then, you know, some of you, most of you probably remember cassette tapes, man. I wore cassette tapes out. I'd listen to cassette tapes, and I would have notebooks full of notes. I'd stop that tape. I'd write down that sentence. I'd stop it again and write down another sentence. I had notebooks full of notes because I had a hunger for the Word of God. You know, even to this day, I'm amazed that sometimes I can quote scripture that I hadn't necessarily read in quite some time. But why can I quote that scripture? Because I put that scripture in my heart. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Amen. And so spending time in the word, asking God, God, give me a fresh hunger for the word of God. And again, we start off so on fire for God oftentimes and so desirous of his word so oftentimes. But then life happens. Life happens, and, and, and whatever might happen, we get beat down, or we get distracted, or we uh, get involved with the cares of this life, and we don't have quite the hunger and the fire that we once had for the things of God. And, and to be honest with you, I see uh, the church has changed overall. Not this church. I'm not talking about this church per se. I'm talking about the church has changed overall. Because I remember when I was young, in the early 80s, uh, the people that I was, was hanging around, they were, they were on fire. They, they, were, they were expecting God to move. They were expecting great things from God. Uh, they they uh, had faith for the miraculous. They had faith for healing. But today, something's changed. People have become, I don't know, uh, dry in their hearts. They, they become dry in their outlook. They become, uh, instead of optimistic, pessimistic in their outlook on life and, and what the future might hold. Uh, but, you know, that's not the will of God. Believers in Christ ought to be the most optimistic people on the face of the earth. Amen? Because, because, because he lives. I can face tomorrow. And because he lives, all fear is gone. And I know my life, my future is in his hands. How about you? Amen. And so we can live with optimism. We can live with anticipation. We can live excited about tomorrow. Not a drudgery, not, not a worry, not a concern thinking that, you know, what's going to happen next? No, let's, let's look at these opportunities that are happening in the world, these challenges, these things that are going on. This is setting the stage for a mighty move of God because people that are uh, going through all of this chaos, whether it be financial, whether it be uh, health-wise, whether it be rioters and looters, and everything else. How many of you know even the rioters and looters are looking for a cause? I've got one for them. How about you? Amen? I've got a cause for the rioters and the looters. It's a better cause than they could ever imagine, but they got to surrender to Christ first and foremost. Isn't that right? Amen? Amen. Well, I, I tell you, I preach myself happy already today. I'm telling you right now. All right, now verse 19. Repent, therefore... And be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive or retain is the idea. Whom heaven, how many of you know he's in heaven seated at the right hand of the Father? Whom heaven must retain until the times, seasons of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Now, I could read on and on with this, but notice now, not only does it mention times of refreshing, he also says that heaven will retain Jesus, that Jesus will not come until there's times of the restoration of all things. Now, I'm not going to uh, try to, uh, uh, you know, even begin to describe what that means because I'm not even sure all that means. But what I do know is this, uh, that instead of looking at a, a time of destruction, we ought to be looking for times of restoration. Are you hearing what I'm telling you here today? Is everybody doing all right? He says that before Jesus comes, he will be retained in heaven until the times of restoration of all things. I don't know what that restoration all is, but I know one thing. I'm looking forward to restoration. I'm not looking forward to destruction. I'm looking forward to refreshing. I'm not looking forward to uh, some kind of a, a, you know, a, a, a church that's down and out and, and barely getting along and, and holding on to the end of the rope until Jesus comes. I'm looking for a glorious church that's not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That's the kind of church he's coming after. Amen? I'm sorry. I guess I'm getting excited here. But you know what Jesus said? He said, I will build my church. How many of you know if he's the builder, nobody's going to knock it down? 
He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell, the powers of hell, the authorities of hell shall not. Everybody say shall not. He, they shall not prevail against the church. I mean, that is not maybe not. That's a shall not. It shall not. They shall not. Satan shall not. His demonic host shall not prevail against the church. And I say to you today that that is the same thing for this church. And the church is the people. And so we could say this, that he's going to build you, church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against you in Jesus' name. Amen? And so I just want to encourage you with that, and maybe I'll get into this message next week. But nevertheless, I, I do thank God for His Spirit. Amen? And the Holy Spirit moving. I believe the Word of the Lord today has been what the Word of the Lord is. I, I don't doubt one bit that this message that I ended up giving was not from the Spirit of God. And so we take it as being, you know what? God spoke to us today. Amen? God wanted to encourage us today. He wanted to help us today to not be looking and, and, and expecting a season of destruction for us. Now, the world will experience destruction because you don't live for God. You're going to be, you know, there's going to be destruction, right? But for the church, times of restoration, times of refreshing from the Spirit of God. See, we're entering in. It's already begun. We're entering into this separation. The separation, where the separation between those that truly follow Christ and those that don't is going to be more apparent than ever before. So that means what? That means the church is going to get better, the world's going to get worse, but the world's going to look over here, many of them, not all of them, they're going to look at the church and they're going to see, they're going to see something. And they're going to say, you know what, I want, I want out of this and I want that. Amen? Are you following me here today? Amen? If you've been blessed by this message today, please prayerfully consider giving to help support the ministry of Abounding Grace Christian Church. No gift is too small, and we'll agree with you in prayer that God will continue to bless you richly for your support. If you'd like to give online, go to agcc.church. The link is found below, and look for the green tab near the top that says Give Online. Or you can send your gift by mail to the address also below. Thank you so much, and God bless.